thanks everyone for uh, joining us today. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Liam Connor. Um, Liam uh, is currently a uh, Tolden Fellow with us here, but um, did his undergrad at McGill, uh, PhD at uh, Toronto and CETA with Wayne Ken East Vandalin, working on various things to do with the Chime telescope, but um, ended up with the um, FRB side of the Chime Pathfinder. He then moved to the Netherlands uh, to work on the Apatit instrument at the Westerbor Observatory uh, before coming here, joining us as a Pi Fellow, working on um, a variety of things, really. So Liam um, uh, forged really great connections with uh, the uh, CMS um, department um, across campus with Katie Bauman working DSA 2000 imaging. He's um, dived right into DSA 110, which he'll tell you a bit about today, uh, as well as uh, new projects like uh, G-Rex, a galactic um, FRB research experiment. Um, Liam's also, um, for those who don't know, a champion um, skier, um, <laughs> which, uh, um, and uh, so to really take it away. Thanks. Great, thank you. Thank you, Vikram, and, and thanks everybody for coming. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to give this colloquium. So usually when we hear about fast radio bursts, it's in the context of the great mystery surrounding their origin. You know, what is producing these radio pulses that comes from cosmological distances? You know, why is a, a phenomenon that's seemingly so extreme uh, also so common that there are thousands across the sky each day with a volumetric rate that's higher than even core collapse supernovae? Um, and then finally, what is the nature of repetition? Most FRBs are detected exactly once. A subset of them seems to repeat. And these are all fascinating questions. FRBs have proved to be phenomenologically very rich. Um, and I have no doubt that in coming years, they will continue to throw us for a loop. That's not what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm not going to be talking about the mystery of FRBs. Instead, I'm going to be focusing on uh, using FRBs as a probe of other astronomy and physics that we might care about. Now, any time a new extragalactic source class is discovered, especially with transients, we have these grand aspirations for how we can apply them to cosmology and fundamental physics. This was true for GRBs, supernovae, of course, gravitational waves, with a wide uh, variety of successes and, in some cases, disappointments. So my goal today is really to try to convince you that not only is our optimism about FRB cosmology warranted, uh, but actually this era has already begun. Um, and just for the cosmologists in the room, please note that I'm going to be using the word cosmology somewhat liberally today. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of messy astrophysics as well. Okay, so what do we actually see when we detect a fast radio burst? Usually it looks something like this. Uh, this is a dynamic spectrum, radio frequency on the y-axis, pulse arrival time on the x-axis. And the FRB is this swept pulse that goes from the top left to the bottom right of the plot. It's very narrow, typically about a millisecond, but we've seen them down to of order microsecond durations, and there's currently not really a floor for how short duration they can be. Uh, they're broadband, they cover a wide range of radio frequencies. This one is at about a gigahertz. Um, and they're dispersed. They're dispersed because as the pulse travels through the universe and encounters plasma, that gas is going to impart uh, a frequency dependent uh, group velocity on the wave, which will manifest as this characteristic lambda squared dispersion sweep. So we characterize this dispersion sweep by a dispersion measure, which you'll, you'll hear a lot about today, dm, which is basically a line of sight integral of all the electrons between us and the source. This is a very small effect in the grand scheme of things. This, this FRB traveled for billions of years, and it was only slowed down by 700 milliseconds between the top and the bottom of the band. But compared to other sources, like galactic pulsars, uh, this DM is actually quite large. So for a high galactic latitude, you'd only expect roughly this much DM from the Milky Way's ISM. You might get a little bit more from the galactic halo, although this is uh, very uncertain at the moment. We'll hear more about this later. The lion's share usually comes from the intergalactic medium, or the IGM. So even though the IGM is very diffuse, uh, this is by far the longest path length that the FRB travels on. So that tends to dominate the observed DM. Presumably the FRB resides in some host galaxy and its ISM or maybe plasma near the source and a supernova remnant or an H2 region will contribute to the host galaxy DM. 
Now, even this is sort of a simplification, and that's because for FRBs beyond about redshift 0 0.4, you expect them to intersect at least one galaxy, uh, galaxy's halo in the foreground. That halo is full of hot gas, and the circumgalactic medium is going to impart some dispersion measure uh, as well. And the amount that it's going to impart will, of course, uh, depend on the impact parameter, but also things that we don't have a good grasp of yet, such as feedback and the distribution of baryons within these halos. So this is a major open question. How is gas distributed in the CGM? And we think we can uh, go after it with fast radio burst dispersion measures. Along special sight lines, you might intersect or even be embedded in a galaxy cluster. And in that case, the intercluster medium, or the ICM, is going to give a significant amount of dispersion measure, DM. Uh, again, more on this later. OK, so ever since the inception of the field, the first uh, FRB ever detected in 2007, it's been a central goal to try to use FRBs as a probe of cosmology. So if you look at the original paper by Duncan Lorimer, 2007, the final sentence says, if redshifts of their host galaxies are measurable, the potential of a population of radio bursts at cosmological distances to probe the ionized IGM is very exciting. Note this is before they had the name FRB. And ever since then, there's been this kind of bifurcation of efforts where we're trying to study in parallel these twin problems of what are FRBs and what can we do with them. So here I'm showing a Sankey diagram where the width of those streams coming out of each uh, subject correspond to my very subjective assessment about how much people actually uh, care about these subfields. So in the former category, it's cut off a little bit. Um, but FRBs as a probe, you know, finding the missing baryons. At the moment, there's no single probe that can actually account for more than 30% of the baryons in the universe. Gravitational lensing is very interesting. I'll talk about FRB lensing in a few slides. Uh, and then measuring the cosmological parameters using FRBs, including H0. Now, I've placed these as sort of separate categories, but you should, see, you, you should think of these rivers as kind of flowing in and out of each other. Some of these are inextricably linked. For example, uh, I think the best chance we'll have at actually measuring cosmological parameters with FRBs is going to come from constraining the power spectrum of the baryons, handing it over to weak lensing folks, and alleviating one of their key systematics. In the category of FRBs, the mystery, of course, people care a lot about the progenitors. Uh, are they magnetars, black holes, normal pulsars? The, phys the radio emission mechanism, we know it has to be a coherent process, but is this happening in the magnetosphere? Is it happening outside of the magnetosphere in an accretion disk? We don't know. Host galaxies, is there a preferred host galaxy type? Do they have some uh, informative offset distribution? And then, of course, repetition. I mentioned before that a subset of FRBs repeats. A smaller subset of those repeats periodically, and we, we know the origin of neither, basically. OK, so in some superficial sense, we've actually already localized the missing baryons using fast radio bursts. This is the McCor relation. It's cut off at the top. It's named after the great radio astronomer, J.P. McCor, uh, who was here as a postdoc and who tragically passed away a couple of years ago. He showed that cosmological contribution to dispersion measure increases roughly linearly with the redshift of the FRB. And you can use the slope of this relation to constrain omega b. So in some sense, we found the missing baryons using FRBs. But of course, we already knew omega b from the CMB and from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. synthesis. What we really want to pin down is the distribution of baryons in the universe. So just to show how hard this is both to observe and to simulate, uh, here I'm showing two simulations side by side. It's the same volume. On the left is the original illustrious. On the right is illustrious TNG. And if you could see the dark matter distribution in both cases, you would note that they're almost identical. But because, and there are obviously plenty of experts here, I think because of just the subgrid prescription uh, and the resulting feedback, the, at redshift zero, the gas distributions between left and right are almost unrecognizable. 
Now you might say, well, we, we know illustrious, the original illustrious was wrong, uh, so it's kind of an unfair comparison, but it's still the case that as advanced and sophisticated as these cosmological simulations have gotten, uh, there's still significant disagreement between the different codes. So here I'm showing uh, the fraction of gas in halos as a function of halo mass for kind of smallish galaxy groups of the clusters. And you can see there are order one differences between Eagle, Simba, Illustrious. So it's not just that it's really hard to measure this diffuse gas observationally, it's also hard to simulate. And it's hard to simulate uh, because this is a very messy nonlinear process. Feedback is kind of the bone in the throat of maybe the largest subfield of astrophysics, namely galaxy formation. So you have warm, hot gas in the intergalactic medium. It falls into gravitational potential wells. It cools radiatively, eventually forms stars. And if this were unregulated, then all the baryons in the universe would turn into stars. And this doesn't happen, and that's because it is regulated. And you have negative feedback. Supernovae, winds, uh, AGN expel gas, inject energy and momentum, uh, and end up with a distribution of baryons around these halos that's very hard to predict. What we'd really like is a large sample of localized fast radio bursts, some of which will intersect halos, and some of whose uh, halo gas will contribute to the DM of FRPs. Now, the next best thing to a large sample of localized FRBs is a large sample of unlocalized FRBs. This is the CHIME telescope, which I worked on as a student, and Vicar mentioned before. It's in British Columbia, Canada. Um, and it's a terrific machine for finding fast radio bursts. Unfortunately, it can't localize them. It has a localization precision of about 10 arc minutes. Um, but last year, they published a catalog of about 600 uh, unlocalized fast radio bursts. So this means you don't have a host galaxy, and it also means you can't unambiguously associate that sight line with the CGM of a galaxy at redshift 0.5, for example, uh, because the angular precision is not good enough. What we did instead is we said, do the FRBs that intersect galaxies in the local universe within 40 megaparsecs, where the halos still have a large angular size, do they have any DM excess with respect to those that don't? So what I'm showing here are uh, FRBs from that CHIME catalog. The color encodes the dispersion measure. The bigger colored circles are FRBs that have intersected a galaxy halo within 40 megaparsecs. And those gray circles correspond to the rough angular size of the halos. So here's the local group M31 and M33, M81 group, and so on. And we find that indeed, those that intersect halos within 40 megaparsecs have slightly larger dispersion measures than those that do not. So you can see that as a histogram in the top panel. In the bottom panel, we're showing this DM excess, uh, presumably from the halos, as a function of threshold impact parameter. So you can see the signal in black goes to zero once you're well outside of the virial radii of these halos. So this is the first statistical evidence for halo gas using fast radio bursts. The amplitude of the excess is actually a little puzzling. It's larger than we'd expect. It's probably significantly larger than you should get uh, from a field galaxy on its own whose CGM has been intersected. So the way we explain that is by noting that three quarters of the galaxies in our sample actually belong to massive galaxy groups. And this galaxy group will have a shared plasma in the intragroup medium uh, shown here. And you can convert this figure I was showing before into a DM excess uh, as a function of halo mass, and we find that even though there is significant disagreement between the different simulations, uh, you can account for the excess that we saw by invoking the intergroup medium. Okay, so fast radio bursts are really good at finding the diffuse uh, baryons in the universe. It turns out they're also quite good at finding the dense dark matter in the universe, and that's via gravitational lensing. So the basic setup is as follows. Some fraction of sight lines uh, are going to be strongly gravitationally lensed by some intervening mass, ML. And you'll end up seeing two or more copies of the same burst with some gravitational lensed time delay, delta T. Delta T will depend on the uh, mass of this lens and also the geometry of that system. So this has been considered for many decades already in the case of supernovae and time variable 
AGN, GRBs as well. The thing that sets FRBs apart is, of course, they're very narrow in duration. So you can already get arbitrary precision on this delta T, which you cannot get for time variable uh, quasars. Um, but you can actually do significantly better than that, and that has to do with the coherent nature of FRBs. Uh, so this is a kind of technical, and uh, I'll use a fair bit of radio lingo, but the basic idea is um, with radio telescopes, we're sampling the electric field itself. We're not just making an incoherent detection of the pulse. We actually preserve phase information about the FRB's waveform. Uh, so that means if we use this phase-preserving what we call voltage data, the time stream for the FRB will look something like this. If it's truly a lens copy uh, of the same burst, it should be an identical waveform. And that means you can cross-correlate, or rather auto-correlate, this time stream and look for peaks at non-zero lags. If it were just a repeat burst from, a, from the same FRB or a different FRB altogether, you will not get any power in this correlation. So what that means is you can actually go well below the duration of the pulse. You're not limited by the one millisecond time scale of the burst. You're limited, at least in principle, by the sampling time of your telescope, which in this case is nanoseconds. And so this means you can go to really unprecedented time delays due to gravitational lensing. What I'm showing here on the top panel is delta T, this gravitational lens time delay, as a function of lens mass, assuming the source is coming from redshift one and the, the lens is at redshift 0.5. On the bottom is delta theta, the, the angular separation, twice the Einstein radius. And if you can really go below microseconds in delta T, this gives you access to something like 15 orders of magnitude in lens mass. Okay, so you can go all the way down from microlensing events, searching for machos, primordial black holes, uh, stars, even free-floating planets, to the sort of millilensing regime, searching for IMBHs, uh, all the way up to the traditional use cases for this time delay cosmography technique, uh, where you're lensed by a massive galaxy, and the lensing time delays are kind of days to months. That's right, yeah. Yeah, so the, yeah, there have been arguments in the literature claiming that you would, in the absence of things like scattering, you would preserve coherence even for a, um, yeah, even for the lensing time scales that you're talking about. Um, but there's, there's significant uncertainties about scattering and things like this, decohering. Uh, so if you want to go into the gritty details, we put out this paper at the end of last year uh, where we sort of forecast over this enormous range of lens masses and, for example, uh, show the region of parameter space you can rule out for primordial black holes as a fraction of dark matter. Um, one fun idea that, that was in this paper as well is, again, kind of combining two of these FRB applications, the baryons and the lensing. Um, so I started thinking about this, actually, when I attended my first Caltech Colloquium way back in, I think, October 2020, Gwen Rudy from Carnegie was talking about uh, studying the CGM on small um, physical scales using gravitationally lensed quasars. So the idea is, is basically this. You have some gravitationally lensed quasar. Those two sight lines will uh, go through the CGM um, with different impact parameters, and you can learn something through absorption spectroscopy about the components of the CGM. You can do the exact same thing with FRB dispersion measures. So if you think about it, if an FRB is lensed by a massive galaxy, uh, the angular deflection is small enough that the only difference in the dispersion measure that you see will come from the different paths you take through the lensed galaxy CGM. And so just with one object, you have this direct measurement of the column density of electrons um, as a function of impact parameter. Okay, I'd now like to offer a census, an observational census, of where we are in the field of fast radio bursts. So I'm showing a table. This is somewhat incomplete, but it gives, gives a rough idea of where we're at, of blind detections from telescopes around the world. So by blind detection, I mean not following up a repeater, just searching the sky, waiting for something to show up and detecting it. So again, CHIME is really good at finding FRBs, not so good yet at localizing them. 
Uh, ASCAP in Australia is an interferometer. It can localize them, and it's, it's got about 20 unlocalized events and about 20 localized events. Apertif in the Netherlands, it's found a couple dozen. Same with Parks in Australia. Uh, FAST is an extremely sensitive telescope, but with a, a small field of view, so um, it's not especially good at finding these FRBs blindly. Now, I've left out a, a lot of really impressive FRB science. For example, if you put uh, FAST on a repeater, it'll probably find heaps of events because of its sensitivity. Uh, Casey Law's project, Real Fast, on the VLA is terrific at localizing repeating uh, fast radio bursts. But these are the blind detections. Now, the two things that these telescopes all have in common is one, they've done really impressive uh, fast radio burst science, and two, they were all not built for fast radio burst science. Uh, so CHIME, when I worked on it as a student, was explicitly designed to uh, look for the BAO signal in 21 centimeter emission and try to learn something about dark energy. ASCAP, Apertif, built long before FRBs had really taken off. Parks, uh, of course, has been around for many decades, and it's true for FAST as well. It was not specifically designed for FRBs. The one exception to this rule is Caltech's Deep Synoptic Array, the DSA-110 at the Owens Valley Radio Observatory, which I'm showing here. So the DSA-110 is an interferometer. It was purpose-built to detect and localize FRBs to arc second precision, such that we can learn about their host galaxies and do the sorts of FRB applications that I'm talking about today. Here's the DSA science team, led by Greg and Vikram. Vikram has done a really heroic job at building this thing, getting it on sky, and extracting science from it, uh, with the help of uh, a whole bunch of staff, graduate students, and postdocs. Um, this thing really could not have been built without the staff at OVRO itself, shown here, who very deservedly won Caltech's Team Impact Award last year. OK, so here's the, uh, the array itself. You see this yellow T. At the moment, because we're in commissioning mode, it's populated by uh, 48 antennas. And on those 48 antennas, we're continuously searching for fast radio bursts. If we see something, we send a signal to what we call these outrigger antennas in blue, where they're kind of operating in a time machine mode. They can freeze uh, whatever they just saw, dump the raw voltage data to disk, and we can uh, interferometrically localize the burst offline. We're able to do this because of the long baselines they provide. So if we go back to this table, between 2007 and 2021, we localized maybe a couple dozen fast radio bursts to arc second precision. In the last year of commissioning, we more than doubled this yield using the DSA-110. So here are the first 30 FRBs that we've discovered and localized. Uh, unfortunately, it's a little bit cut off again, but the, um, the bursts are organized from extragalactic DM uh, in increasing order of extragalactic DM. So if you squint, the top, uh, the top row shows much larger galaxies. At the bottom, because this is pan stars and we don't yet have deep images, you actually can't see the hosts in some cases, presumably because they're too far away. Uh, and, and again, this was all done in commissioning mode when we only had 64 antennas. Throughout this year, we're going to start adding antennas, and we could end up with more than uh, twice the detection rate from that increased sensitivity. Um, so when you have more than a few, but fewer than 1,000, it's kind of annoying and cumbersome to refer to them by their telephone number. So we just started naming them uh, to make it easier, personify the FRBs. So this is Zach. Zach is relatively nearby. It's at redshift 0.04. Uh, there's its host galaxy from pan stars. On the right, you can see its dynamic spectrum. Clearly, there's some interesting temporal structure. Whitney is a little farther away, around redshift 0.5. Again, some uh, interesting temporal structure. It's kind of a two-pronged one. Our brightest one by far is shown here. I think it was detected with like 300 sigma. Really bright. Um, one of our students, Ray, decided to call this one Wilhelm after the Wilhelm scream. Now, surprisingly, uh, you can't actually see its host galaxy, at least in pan stars, despite it seeming to not be all that far away. So either um, we're looking through a void and it really is much farther than its DM suggests, or this is maybe a dwarf host galaxy. 
One, one uh, FRB that really stood out is an FRB named Mark. This was ambiguous at first because its DM was 110. And our best models for the free electrons in our galaxy suggested that the Milky Way should contribute 130 to 190. So forget the IGM, forget the host galaxy. Uh, these models were kind of suggesting that the call was coming from inside the house. Um, but then Greg Hallinan localized it interferometrically and found that it sits right on top of this galaxy at 50 megaparsecs. Now, the sky coverage of, of galaxies within 50 megaparsecs is really small. And the chance coincidence is something like 10 to the minus 4. So we're pretty certain that this, this is indeed an extragalactic FRB. This tells us a couple of interesting things. Uh, for one, we're probably grossly underestimating the uncertainty on our galactic models. And in, actually, in this case, it's probably systematically biased high. Uh, but maybe more interestingly, it tells us that the Milky Way's halo has less material, baryonic material, than previous models had suggested. So we constrain, we set an upper limit for the DM coming from the Milky Way halo. And this allows us to constrain the baryon fraction of the Milky Way to be less than 10%, less than 60% of the universal baryon to dark matter ratio. OK, so if we go back to the McCore relation, remember this is extragalactic DM as a function of FRB redshift. Uh, and we plot our first dozen DSA FRBs on top of it. This sort of fits the trend, right? The scatter around this curve tells you something about the prevalence of voids and filaments in the IGM, as well as the CGM contribution, maybe even host galaxy uh, DM contribution. But fundamentally, that's a one-point statistic. It's kind of messy to deal with. We'd much prefer to have a two-point statistic where we're actually correlating the DMs of fast radio bursts with the structure in the foreground. So I've attempted to start doing that. Uh, here I'm just showing galaxies in a cone within five arc minutes from the DESI legacy imaging surveys. Those are shown in blue. Uh, the FRB itself is this green star, uh, which in this case has been localized with Keck Elris. And then in orange, you can see candidate intervening galaxies, galaxies that come within roughly a virial radius of the sight line. And this is roughly what you expect, you know, one or two or zero or a few interveners. Two sources really stood out. So before we had actually localized this one, it happens to be called Electra, we thought it would be at redshift 0.6 to 0.7 because of its large extragalactic dispersion measure. But you can see by eye, it intersects this kind of big wall of structure at redshift 0 0.1. And sure enough, when we localized it to a host galaxy, it lived within this overdensity. Another one, Jackie, same story, but a bit less extreme. We expected it at redshift 0.25 or so, uh, but sure enough, it lives in this overdensity. So I started cross-matching these positions with group and cluster catalogs. Uh, and sure enough, uh, both galaxies resided in galaxy clusters, very well-known galaxy clusters, actually. This is George Abel's thesis from 1957, published here at Caltech. And you can see the first cluster, it's cut off, but it's, it's uh, Abel 2310. The second one, the second FRB, happens to be actually quite close on sky. So it's the next cluster in the catalog, Abel 2311. This is interesting, not just because it's the first time an FRB has been uh, localized to a galaxy cluster, but also because of the impact that we expect the intracluster medium of the ICM to have on the FRB. So if I just take the uh, illustrious TNG simulation and choose a sight line that I know is going to intersect a galaxy cluster, we can watch how the dispersion measure increases through this trajectory. So DM is increasing uh, on the right just at a, a few units. It'll intersect the galaxy cluster at about 300 kiloparsecs. And when it does that, the dispersion measure from the cluster will dominate the observed DM of the burst. Here's the cluster. Ooh. You get something like 1,000 units at those low impact parameters. We also expect it to impart Faraday rotation, uh, which I'll talk about in a few slides as well. So here's the galaxy cluster 2310, ABLE 2310. Uh, luckily, there's archival data, both SC data and X-ray data. So I'm showing here in white the X-ray intensity from Rosa. The magenta circle is a one megaparsec circle 
corresponding to the Planck SC detection. Uh, this galaxy cluster is in the SC2, Planck SC2 cluster catalog. Uh, and there's a zoom in of the host galaxy association. It's about 520 kiloparsecs from the X-ray centroid. 2311, this galaxy is a little bit farther out. It's uh, just beyond the virial radius at 870 kiloparsecs. This was not in uh, Planck SC2. It wasn't in that cluster catalog. Uh, but Jack Sayers, our um, resident cluster expert, helped and actually made a measurement from archival Planck SC data. And uh, that's what this magenta circle is showing. Now, if you look at this host galaxy, um, you'll notice it's actually quite large. It turns out it's very massive with almost no star formation. And it turns out this is the first FRB uh, host galaxy that is an early type galaxy. This is an elliptical. And this is um, some great work done by Kriti and Jean, which you can see on the top right. I encourage people to keep an eye out for these papers, uh, for this paper, Sharm et al. 2023, which will discuss the implication of an elliptical host galaxy. If your model for the origin of fast radio bursts is that you need a uh, core collapse supernova to produce a very young magnetar, then this is the wrong galaxy for you. So if we analyze the dispersion measure budget and try to pin down where the DM is coming from and uh, how much of an impact the intercluster medium is having, we get a PDF that looks like this. In the first case, this is the one that's offset by just 500 kiloparsecs. So you can see the ICM likely dominates the dispersion measure of this source, which makes sense. We, we thought it was at redshift 0.6 or 0.7 before we localized it. The other one, slightly more marginal, but it seems likely that the ICM is contributing to the dispersion measure of this burst. So we can compare this with simulations. Here I've taken four massive galaxy clusters from TNG 300. And I've uh, computed DM curves. So the bottom row shows dispersion measure as a function of impact parameter, assuming that the, the galaxy uh, is sort of halfway through the cluster along the line of sight. And then I plotted on that our, our estimates for the contribution from the ICM of our two observations uh, at their respective impact parameters. And you can see there's a good amount of variance between the different halos. There's also variance within the halos along different position angles. Uh, but all of those basically agree with our estimates from the DM contribution from the ICM. What we have now is another uh, probe of the intracluster medium from fast radio bursts in addition to the SC and X-ray measurements. So SC measures an integral of the free electrons uh, weighted by their temperature along the line of sight. X-ray luminosity is proportional to that, the integral of NE squared. DM is, of course, just the integral of NE. And RM, or Faraday rotation measure, is NE weighted by the line of sight magnetic field. Now, it'll be hard to compete with uh, X-ray measurements, right? But there are unique advantages to using fast radio bursts, particularly outside of the virial radii of galaxy clusters, where this NE squared uh, means the X-ray luminosity falls off fairly quickly. So uh, for one thing, fast radio bursts are the only extragalactic source for which we can measure both DM and RM. So if we can isolate the RM that's coming from the intercluster medium and isolate the DM from the ICM, then their ratio tells us something about the mean uh, line of sight magnetic field strength. And if we do this in the case of Jackie, we get a few microgauss. This is in line with previous observations as well as simulations. One other kind of fun thing you can do is you can take the ratio of the Compton Y parameter from SZ to dispersion measure and get an estimate for the line of sight temperature. So if I do this uh, for the FRB that's offset by just 500 kiloparsecs, I get a couple KeV. Again, uh, not really revolutionizing the field of ICM studies, but promising. This is certainly the first time we've measured uh, electron temperature using fast radio bursts. And it's promising because in the future, uh, we might be able to do this well beyond the virial radius of the intercluster medium, where the ICM turns into the warm, hot intergalactic medium. So we have this uh, window of a few years right now where DSA-110 will likely continue to detect and localize fast radio bursts at a higher rate, rate than any telescope around the world. And we're very lucky here at Caltech to also have access to significant optical IR resources with which to follow up these FRBs and really map out their foregrounds. So 
Uh, in the next six months, we'll have five nights on Deimos with Keck, four nights with Palomar, and we think we can map out the fields of about 30 fast radio bursts that we've detected, uh, getting roughly 200 spectra uh, for each of those fields. And by doing this really careful mapping of all the structure and the, the halos in front of our FRBs, we think we can constrain the fraction of baryons in the IGM to less than 10%. Okay, so in the future, we'd really like a much larger sample of localized FRBs with which to do cross-correlation studies uh, against upcoming galaxy surveys. So we'd really like many thousands of FRBs, not just 30 or 100, and with those, we can cross-correlate dispersion measures with uh, galaxy catalogs from DESI or SphereX. So the next step in this progression is the DSA-2000. Whereas DSA-110 was really purpose-built for uh, finding and localizing FRBs, DSA-2000 was not built just for fast radio bursts. It was highly optimized for survey speed. And so it's a fundamentally an imaging survey, which will do a lot of really uh, incredible science. So just to emphasize this point about survey speed, here I'm showing uh, survey speed on the y-axis as a function of continuum sensitivity for a bunch of existing telescopes, radio telescopes, in black, and then proposed telescopes in red. And you can see, compared to anything that exists today, uh, DSA 2000 is about two or more orders of magnitude faster, and it's actually even faster than uh, all the proposed radio telescopes as well, including NGVLA uh, and SKA. So I, I won't be able to do DSA 2000 justice in this talk. It deserves its own talk, or actually uh, its own conference. And that's why we're hosting this, <laughs> this meeting at the end of March. Uh, people here are, of course, encouraged to participate. But just in broad strokes, we expect to do uh, a wide range of science, including multi-messenger astronomy um, with pulsar timing arrays, O5 follow-up, where our field of view is very well matched to the O5 localization region, uh, our cosmic history, so uh, H1 mapping of a huge number of external galaxies, and then of course the dynamic radio sky. DSA 2000 should find millions of slow transients, really revolutionizing that field. And it's also expected to find about 10,000 fast radio bursts localized to sub-arc second precision. Now, one nice thing about having all that collecting area and the sensitivity of DSA 2000 is you get a really deep redshift distribution. So I'm showing here the modeled PDF for the redshift distribution for Chime in purple versus DSA 2000 in black. Uh, so we think we'll find a significant number of FRBs beyond redshift 2, maybe even FRBs beyond redshift 4 or 5, with which we can study helium and potentially even hydrogen reionization. And that aids in a lot of the cosmological applications I've talked about today. So gravitational lensing optical depth is a strong function of source redshift we expect to find of order 10 uh, lensed FRBs. Uh, and we also hope to do these cross-correlation analyses. So just to emphasize this point again, um, there's significant uncertainty in the behavior of the baryons, uh, which will impact upcoming uh, really major cosmological experiments, particularly weak lensing experiments. So here I'm showing th uh, the ratio of the power spectrum with dark matter and baryons to dark matter only. <coughs> Uh, for different simulations, and you can see that you not only deviate from one uh, by, in some cases, 30 or 40 percent, but there's significant disagreement between the cosmological simulations. And so in principle, with 10,000 localized FRBs plus DESI, you could measure this baryon power spectrum or pull a baryon power spectrum out of the cross power spectrum uh, between the galaxies and the FRBs, hand it to the cosmologist, and help with one of their key systematics. One, one fun thing, too, with DSA 2000 that I don't think any other FRB survey is doing is we're going to spend about 5% of our time on these deep drilling fields, which could be just one field potentially of 10 square degrees. This will be chosen to coincide with the Rubin deep drilling fields. There'll be plenty of uh, X-ray data, the Cosmos field. And in that 10 square degrees, we could find of order 500 fast radio bursts, so 50 sources per square degree. Um, I sort of think of this as like a conic cosmological terrarium where you have every source, every host galaxy, every foreground galaxy uh, mapped out in multi-wavelength uh, with very deep images. You'll intersect every galaxy cluster in that volume on average at least once, um, and you can do some really interesting application science. <coughs> 
Okay, suppose we wanted to be really ambitious and we wanted to find a million fast radio bursts. I think for the progenitor studies, you would actually hit diminishing returns fairly quickly. I don't think you learn that much uh, more with a million FRBs than you do with, say, 10,000. For the cosm cosmological science, for FRB cosmology, you really do want a million sources. Okay? So how do we actually design a survey that could find one? After all, we're not really running out of them. There are a huge number of fast radio bursts. I think one thing you would do is you would get rid of dishes altogether. Okay? Parabolic reflectors are great for collecting photons and making sure you have a nice primary beam response, but fundamentally they limit field of view. And so what you would do is what we've done with the Galactic Radio Explorer, G-Rex. Here's Karen Sheila, the project engineer in the audience. This is the first G-Rex terminal. G-Rex is just an antenna that will sit in a field and look for the rarest, brightest FRBs, uh, which will likely come from our own galaxy. But what if you had 50,000 of these antennas? And what if you combined the signals on them coherently? This actually isn't a new um, array design. Uh, Overo's LWA, antennas in the field, low far in the Netherlands, excuse me. Um, in this case, we would call this a dense aperture array, where you'd have a very small footprint on the ground with a huge number of antennas to build up collecting area. The difference between this design and previous designs is we feel that we now have the signal processing technologies to actually feasibly do it. Search the whole field of view, which may be as much as 10,000 square degrees, 24-7 uh, with a border 100 microsecond resolution. These technologies are uh, some of the signal processing boards that have been built for 5G technologies and things like tensor cores on NVIDIA GPUs. Um, I refer to this design as the coherent all-sky monitor, or the CASM. We, we uh, in the radio group, have estimated that you could build something that finds maybe 500 or 1,000 FRBs per year for under a million dollars with this design. It would be maybe 700 of these antennas. And the nice thing about this design is it's extremely scalable. You just keep putting antennas on the ground, and if you can keep up with them computationally, uh, you increase the sensitivity of the system linearly. So there's not, the, the ceiling for this sort of approach is, is very, very high. Okay, maybe I'll just conclude here with, with my uh, very dense and chaotic summary slide. I've tried to focus today on FRB cosmological applications where FRBs really have a unique competitive advantage. There's been a huge range of suggestions in the literature about how we could use them to measure h naught and measure the cosmological parameters and so on. I've tried to focus on things where FRBs can do something that most other uh, probes cannot. So that includes finding the so-called missing baryons, which are so diffuse that they're otherwise difficult to detect, uh, capitalizing on the coherent nature of FRBs and the fast time sampling of radio telescopes to do gravitational lensing over a wide range of scales, uh, and also the fact that over the next 10 to 20 years, radio telescopes will really only get more powerful, and the future of this field, I think, is looking extremely bright. So with that, thanks, everybody, and uh, happy to take questions. Yeah, I think, I think a bigger threat than patchiness would be kind of a larger scale anisotropy. So if the halo were for some reason oblate or happened to be low density in that direction, then this could trick us into thinking uh, that the, the total material was smaller just by the sphere, sphericity assumption. Um, patchiness, I think, is unlikely um, given the hot nature of the gas, but maybe simulations say otherwise, I'm not sure. Number of FRBs 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What would DSA bring 2,000 Yeah, we, I've forecasted that the DSA 2,000 will find about 10,000 fast radio bursts with arc second precision or less. This is a limited by the localization or limited by uh, Well, field of view times sensitivity to 1.5 is, is usually the equation we use. Um, so it's got a large field of view, 10 square degrees, got a lot of collecting area, and this ends up being... Um, a few per day. Yeah, no matter um, who is the same technique that will uh, complement uh, this FRP approach uh, studying um, uh, short wind velocity medium, uh, one is to uh, HL for that within my uh, what what when you could do routinely that the Yeah, that's really interesting. I, I'd neither thought of that nor heard anybody discuss it in the literature, so we should talk more. Well, I'm working on that paper. Okay. <laughs> Can you say a word about uh, radio frequency interference? Uh, I know, you know you're mostly on the analytic side, but on the technical side, what, are, what is the impact on this sort of uh, prediction? Um, so RFI is always going to be a nuisance for any radio telescope. Um, it hasn't actually been a bottleneck in the case of the DSA-110, and that has to do with our RFI excision algorithms and also the fact that we're in a valley with relatively low RFI. In the case of DSA-2000, um, a lot of energy was put into site selection. So this is an artist's impression, but this would be Hot Creek Valley in Nevada, and it's got really good uh, RFI properties. I think the biggest threat is actually stuff flying overhead, but even that. Is, is sparse compared to other places in the United States. I had a question. So I had a question about the lensing. You talked about correlating the voltage data. Mm -hmm. How practical is that? How much data do you actually have to save in order to do these correlation searches, and is that a limiting factor? Yeah, it's a good question. So it's actually been put into practice now on the uh, China FRB. Uh, collaboration. These two, these two graduate students did a really amazing job at actually building a pipeline that would do various things like invert filters from the radio telescope and be able to cross-correlate these time streams. I think they end up, they're limited by maybe 30 sec, they can, they can store like 30 seconds of voltage data or something. Um, you're limited on the low end maybe at um, like 100 nanosecond lensing time delays uh, by systematics. Mm -hmm. Does that change the way you use them in a probe, maybe, or? 
um, if it became common to co-detect yeah. X-ray sources with FRBs? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how it would fit into the sort of FRBs as a probe or applications. It would certainly be very interesti interesting in terms of emission physics. Right. Yeah.